If I can get folks' attention, we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome to our panel discussion on climate and our psyche. I'm very fortunate to have two superb speakers, Dr. Susan Clayton to my left, and still working on the, uh, the great equalizer audiovisual, Dr. Lisa von Susteren to my right. But we'll go ahead and get started. I'm Dr. Rob Byron. I'm an internist in southern Montana and a member of the CCL health team. What we'll do this afternoon is uh, both Dr. Clayton and Dr. Van Susteren will speak for about 20 or 25 minutes each, um, and then we'll have time for question and answers after that. When we get to the question and answers, uh, just for the sake of, of recordings, we'll try to repeat it, but speak up when you ask the question since we don't have mics out in the audience. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Clayton. All right, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Uh, I just want to start by saying I'm really honored to be here because you all are doing the work that is going to make a difference. You're reaching out to talk to people about the policies that we need to, uh, and the various ways in which we need to address the issue of climate change that will allow us to um, continue to survive and, and hopefully thrive as a society. Uh, my goal here today is to give you a psychological perspective on some of the impacts on climate change in the hopes that this will give you uh, some subject matter that you can usefully refer to. And so uh, I call it mental health, but also very broadly um, personal and social well-being. So think of health in a, in a kind of a broad way. And for some of you, and, and I encounter people like this, who might be thinking, well, why why do we even uh, need to talk about the psychological impacts of climate change? You know, isn't it all about polar bears and icebergs and so on? Um, oh, I just, sorry, I skipped. I was going to make this great point, and somehow I managed to skip two slides at once. Um, so you're supposed to look at this and think about how you feel and then uh, think about how that makes you feel. And you can begin to get the sense of the kind of, um, if you felt a little bit uh, depressed, if you felt a little bit anxious, if you felt a little bit uh, glum, that's how uh, climate change can begin to have psychological impacts. But we know people are concerned about climate change. Um, and in fact, they seem to be getting more concerned. So this is a positive thing. This graph ends in 2016. I believe I read that um, the levels of concern in 2017 are now at the highest they've been since 2008. So really, people are beginning to be aware that climate change is an issue that's going to uh, affect them and, and that needs to be addressed. But we also know that, uh, that there's a lot of debate, that climate change discussions are very um, politicized and often partisan, and so it can be hard to, as, as I'm sure you all know, hard to find the language to talk about climate change. But health impacts really have the potential to transcend the partisan divide. Everybody cares about health. Um, everybody cares about children's health in particular. And uh, one of the things about talking about mental health and psychological well-being is not all of us are going to be directly physically affected by climate change, but we all have the potential to be affected by climate change in the ways we think about it, in the ways we, we worry about it and are concerned about it. Um, so that's another argument for looking at these issues. And just in case some of you are thinking, well, that picture looks familiar. This is actually from the, the Dust Bowl. Um, and I use this picture because I think it's a really good analogy for the kinds of, we, we, the cultural impact of the Dust Bowl, the, the, uh, the economic effects, the psychological effects, the societal effects of people being forced to leave their, their place, their land, um, is a good analogy for thinking about how climate change will affect us. But I want to talk about the impacts of climate change at, um, uh, on our well-being at three different levels, um, ranging from the more specific and concrete to the increasingly abstract. So first, we know that people are affected by natural disasters. They're very uh, acute events in more ways than one. They're, they're powerful, and they're um, time-specific, and they happen, and then they're over. Um, then there are the more gradual impacts from the trends of change in our climate that uh, are ongoing, have no clear endpoint. Things like rising temperatures and rising sea levels. And then third, I also want to talk about um, 
indirect impacts of climate change, and these are really these are really kind of abstract, but how do they affect the way we think about things, the way we think about ourselves, each other, and the world in general? Starting with natural disasters, we know that these are happening. We know that they are going to happen more often due to climate change. And we know that they have impacts on mental health. So this graph just shows the rise in a variety of kinds of natural catastrophes. It was actually developed for insurance companies. Um, and the ones that are increasing the most are the ones that are associated with changing climate, like floods, um, major storms, um, droughts, forest fires. These have, if you think about what it's like to live through a natural disaster, it won't surprise you to know that there are consequences for mental health. Um, Post-traumatic stress disorder is common. Depression or anxiety, increases in substance abuse, suicide and suicidal ideation or thinking about suicide, um, sleep problems, which aren't quite at that level of severity, but for any of us who've had insomnia, we know it can be an issue. Um, people are more likely to engage in risky behaviors after they have suffered a, uh, a natural disaster. So that might include things like not wearing your seatbelt in the car. You think, what's the point if a big storm is about to come and hit? So you don't take care of yourself as much. And we have good evidence for these kinds of impacts on mental health. People have been studying them for decades. Um, for example, Hurricane Katrina is uh, something that's in the recent enough that uh, I think most of us remember it pretty well. Uh, but long enough ago so that the research has really begun to uh, be published that shows some of the effects. Uh, almost 50% of people living in affected areas developed an anxiety or a mood disorder. Um, one in six developed PTSD and suicide, while still at a fairly low level, more than doubled. So we can be really, I think, pretty confident in saying that when natural disasters increase, mental health problems increase. And it's not just these sort of individual mental well-being, but it also affects the community. Domestic abuse goes up after natural disasters. Um, sad, but true. Uh, rates of child abuse, spousal abuse. General levels of violence and conflict in the community tend to go up. And this is partly due to the fact that even after you live through the event, there are some lasting stressors. Uh, there might be economic disruptions. You might have a harder time getting from point A to point B um, within your community. You might not know where medical care is coming from or clean water or food. So these things are stressful and they make you more vulnerable to mental health problems. Of course, not all of us are equally vulnerable. Some people in some communities are particularly vulnerable. For example, women, children, the elderly, uh, members of marginalized communities, uh, those who already have mental health issues. And in general, people who are, they, they can be more vulnerable physiologically, um, as children are, for example, children and the elderly, they're more susceptible to the effects of heat. Uh, for example, many times people who have mental illness, if some of the medications they might be taking also make them more vulnerable to, to heat. Um, some people are more economically vulnerable because money helps you cope with the effects of these uh, disasters. Uh, if you don't have the money, you're going to probably experience the effects more strongly. And then some people are more socially vulnerable. Um, often if you've experienced discrimination or you have less power within a society, you're less likely to have the resources that help you to cope with the effects of the natural disasters. And uh, again, something that was clearly obvious after Hurricane Katrina. So I think this is um, not surprising, although it's important to remember it, to remind ourselves that these natural disasters have mental health impacts and social impacts, as well as uh, the impacts that are more visible. And these impacts may last. They don't necessarily resolve just within a week or two after the event. They may last for years. But I want to turn now to the issue of gradual climate changes, because this, I think, is less obvious and yet has the potential to affect more people more broadly and more powerfully than the impacts of natural disasters. So what are these gradual changes? Well, we know that the temperatures are increasing. And we actually also know um, from decades of research some of the impacts of higher temperatures. They are associated with aggression. And not just aggression directed outwards, but aggression directed inwards, so higher suicide levels. They also affect our cognitive functioning. This is, you may remember from being a kid, if you had to go to school during the summer, how hard it was to focus. School performance goes down um, when temperatures go up. 
you know, how will this, how, how will these kinds of effects be manifest as the climate changes? You know, we have air conditioning. Um, it's hard to say, but we know that people do respond to heat, not just physiologically, but emotionally and cognitively. Um, one of the key facts about climate change is the uncertainty that's involved. Well, we don't like to feel uncertain. We like to kind of know what's going to happen. So uncertainty leads to anxiety. And there's, there can be stress associated with the, claim, uh, excuse me, the changing climate. Again, economic changes. Um, watching the environment get degraded, watching the damage to sort of physical and, and social infrastructure, all of these can be stressors, and stress has the effect of making you more vulnerable. So stress by itself might not lead to a mental illness, but it might predispose you towards one if you're also suffering from some other issues in your life. One of the ways in which these gradual climate changes is likely to have an impact on our physical and mental health is through migration. So people are already having to migrate because of changing climates, and we know what a problem migration is already for society. Uh, excuse me, for society. It's estimated that um, just the desertification due to climate change could lead to 50 million refugees over the next 10 years. That's a lot of people. And we know that migration is a health risk. It's um, a physical health risk. Obviously, people die. It's a mental health risk, actually. Immigrants are more likely to develop psychosis. And a German report, I think earlier this year, maybe late last year, described levels approaching 50% among recent immigrants for PTSD and depression. And the mental health problems continue among even second generation immigrants. And I'm pointing that out because it shows that it's not just the process of moving that is stressful, um, although it is, but being in a new place, trying to adjust to that new community, facing perhaps hostility from the people who are already there, that continues to put you at increased risk for mental health problems. And I'll just point out, even though it's not health related, that migration is also a security risk, um, something that probably many of you are aware of, that uh, the Department of Defense has talked about climate change as a threat multiplier, in part because of the fact that uh, there'll be increased levels of migration, putting groups into more conflict with each other and competition for space and so on. So again, these gradual changes are not going to affect everyone equally. Um, the poorest countries will be most affected, and within the U.S., the poorest communities will be the most affected. This is a, a very high-level kind of map. It doesn't go into details, but it shows the countries that are most affected by climate change. Um, and of course, you can see that it's very unequal. And if you pause for a second, you can see that it's also um, not the same map that it would be if we said which countries are contributing most to climate change. So not only is there an equal burden of uh, costs, it doesn't compare, it doesn't correspond to uh, the responsibility for causing the problem. And you can imagine that that will lead, has already led, and will continue to lead to resentment and hostility. Inequality in itself threatens mental health and social health. Um, all right, I want to keep on track. The indirect consequences that I talked about earlier, these are things that are, are more speculative, partly because we've only begun to think about them, partly because by their very nature they're, they're hard to study. But I, I think that that doesn't mean they're not worth thinking about. I think they could be very powerful, um, very important consequences of climate change. How does it affect the way we think about things that are important? And I like this picture, um, which is taken in South Miami Beach, because you see this young woman, and she's not traumatized. She's not uh, afraid. She just can't figure out what's going on. It's like my world has changed in this way that I, I can't begin to comprehend. And I think those are some of the kinds of changes that we have to think about. What does it mean when your world starts changing in these ways that, that don't make any sense to you? It can affect the way we think about ourselves. So when we define ourselves, when we define who we are, we often refer to things like, well, here's what I do. You know, this is my occupation. Here's my lifestyle. Here's my culture. Um, here are the things I'm capable of doing. All of these are threatened by climate change. Certainly, um, for some people, occupation is very strongly threatened. Farmers and other people who work in close contact with the land. 
And research has shown, for example, increased levels of suicide among farmers who have been affected by drought, for example. Um, if you define yourself as a farmer and you can't farm anymore, it really threatens something very fundamental. Loss of lifestyle, I could give you a, a flip example and say, you know, coffee. Coffee is threatened by climate change. That would be a big change to many of our lifestyles. Some people, of course, their culture is more fundamentally threatened because their culture prescribes certain ways of relating to the natural world. And then autonomy is just our ability to control our environments and, and get done what we want to get done. And we learn certain ways of re relating to the world based on a certain environment that are threatened when the environment changes. It could be as simple as, you know, when do you plant your garden? When do you... You know, when do you shovel your front walk and when is it safe to put away your summer things or your winter things? So when things start changing, it just threatens our sense of capability, our ability to function um, in ways that, again, can undermine our image of ourselves. The ways in which we relate to others may be threatened by climate change. Um, if we're staying inside in air-conditioned rooms, there may be fewer opportunities for social interaction than and people used to sort of walk around the neighborhood, gather at the swimming pool, and so on. If communities have to disperse, if they have to leave their home territories, their social bonds are going to be disrupted. And those social bonds are very, very important for protecting not only mental but physical health. And again, there's increased conflict over resources like fresh water and land that's suitable for planting. So the idea that climate change will increase levels of conflict between groups is um, very strongly supported. And then there's the idea that the way we think about the world might be threatened. Um, we tend to feel attached to particular places. We talk about where are my roots. And I think that suggests something very powerful about what it means to lose that, uh, those, uh, those uh, attachments, those bonds of affection. It can shake your world to not be able to count on the things that you were used to counting on. We can feel like we're no longer grounded, we're alienated. Um, and I think this quote from a Hurricane Sandy survivor sums up this idea. Um, you think your house is permanent. When you lose your house and everything you own, you learn everything is temporary. If you're really learning everything is temporary, that's a pretty powerful change to your ways of thinking and a re really powerful threat to your sense of security. A couple of examples of how indigenous cultures might be affected. Um, I like this example because it is so clear. You can see the lake change in three years. Um, and these people called themselves the people of the lake. So what does it mean when you were the people of the lake and there is no lake? There are plenty of environmental refugees in China and um, the assumption is that that is going to be a trend that continues to increase. But again, Sorry, wrong way. You, you may or may not know that there are already displaced communities in the United States. So certainly among uh, native Alaskans, Alaskan villages that are essentially sinking into the permafrost um, and the, or the coastline is eroding away. Um, and down in Louisiana, uh, I, can't, I was going to look up the name of the island and I forgot to look it up, but um, people on the Louisiana coast where the land is also being eroded and disappearing actually have received federal monies to relocate, becoming the first um, mainland US climate refugees. Okay, so I want to close with something, some positive words. Um, and the idea is we are threatened with all these things um, that I've just described, but they're not inevitable. Some people come through natural disasters and they, they are just fine, they're totally resilient. Some people even talk about growth in the face of those kinds of challenges. So I want us to focus on um, the possibilities for resilience and growth. And in terms of communicating with other people, I think it's important to emphasize um, positivity. So focus on adaptation. We are past the point of talking about let's avoid climate change because we're not going to avoid it. Um, we can hopefully minimize it. But if we talk about adapting to it, that's a positive message. That suggests a forward-looking, positive approach to living in the new kinds of circumstances we face. In messaging, you can emphasize that addressing climate change will have co-benefits, and um, not just economic, which I'm sure some of you are used to talking about, but health co-benefits. So if we reduced carbon emissions, how could we do that? We could walk more, um, we could eat less red meat, 
These are things that would have really positive effects on our physical health, and just reducing the levels of carbon in the atmosphere would also enhance our physical health, um, you know, for our respiratory health in particular. Providing people with access to healthy nature enhances both physical and mental health, and there's a, a large and growing body of literature talking about the ways in which exposure to healthy natural environments is good for us. So there really is, there are benefits to addressing climate change. Um, we need to think about how to get individuals to become resilient. And there's evidence on what kinds of things are associated with resilience. Um, practical support is always important. I don't want to emphasize that it's all in the brain. Sometimes you need some actual physical support. Social bonds, community ties are very important for promoting individual resilience. A sense of optimism and some active strategies so you feel like there is something you can do. Um, you're actively involved in addressing the problem. And that can help people not only to feel more positive, but to cope with the kind of stress of worrying about it when people feel engaged in the, in the activity. And we also need to, com uh, to promote community resilience. Um, and this is really important. And some communities are beginning to address this. So prepare by, by examining what are going to be the impacts on your local community. What can you like? What, what impacts can you um, expect to see over the next 10 years, over the next 20 years as the climate changes? Um, organize to address those impacts. Diversity promotes resilience, and I mean diversity at all kinds of levels, diverse um, kinds of voices. So it shouldn't just be one sector of community talking to other sectors about what they should do, but people from multiple sectors, multiple kind of uh, layers of the community coming together. And finally, anything that can help the community be more adaptable is going to make them more resilient. And I'm, I'm going to close by saying I think we need to be thinking about uh, the idea that crisis in general can be an opportunity to create innovation, to think about not just how can we cope with this problem, but to think of it as an opportunity to re-examine our community structures and maybe come up with some better ways of living. And here's a quote from The Lancet, which is a, a British medical journal fairly recently, just saying countries should, will have to undergo a shift from an understanding climate change as a threat to embracing the response to climate change as an opportunity for human health and well-being. Thank you. So I'm going to give this talk without uh, providing any Novocaine, if you know what I mean. <laughs> um, I was asked to give an overview of the mental health and psychosocial toll of climate change. The success stories providing hope and showing human resilience will be addressed later. About my tone, as a physician using the medical model, the patriarchal attitude that patients should be protected from the truth about their life-threatening illness was abandoned long ago because it treated people like they were children, suggesting the doctor knew better what they could hear. But treating patients like children stood in the way of making informed decisions. The same goes for infantilizing the public about the climate crisis. The public needs to know the truth. That said, telling people bad news is tough and must be a two-step process. Number one, telling it like it is, and two, offering empowering actions that help alter the outcome. We can prevent or manage the worst impacts of climate change if we want it enough to take action. All the physical impacts of climate change, those affecting us both directly or indirectly, all the losses, injuries, illnesses, and displacement, carry with them an attendant emotional toll that must be included as we tally up the mental health and psychosocial impacts of climate change. Today, I will emphasize what is overlooked and carries the biggest burden, starting with some of the psychological impacts for which we have data, and then moving on to what is not so easy to measure. For as important as data is, we must not get lost in it at the expense of drawing emotion, because emotion is at the heart of what moves people to action. Extreme weather events, heat waves, storms, fires, and floods, increasingly intense and frequent. In the last two decades, extreme weather has wounded, displaced, or required emergency assistance for four billion people. Half a million have died. Heat. July 21, 2016, Kuwait, temperature recorded at 129.2 degrees, the world's record. Next door in Iraq, it was 129. 15 of the 16 hottest years on record, as most of you well know, have occurred since 2001. 
Temperature and aggression, what we know of the link between extreme climate and weather events to an increase in aggression. For each standard deviation of increased temperature and rainfall, we can expect a 4% increase in conflict between individuals and a 14% increase in conflict among groups. These findings are valid for all ethnicities and across every region of the world. So, more assaults, murders, and suicides, and an increase in unrest all over the world should come as no surprise. Floods are responsible for half of the disasters from extreme weather events. Bacteria, viruses, parasites, chemicals, human and animal waste are washed into flood waters. Vectors swarm in it. Exposure to the water puts us into contact with these pathogens. We drink it, bathe in it, clean up in it, and after the waters recede, live in it. Though the immediate threat may not be visible, the illnesses can show up down the road. Think lead and flint. I cite this as an example because the rage at government inaction when people believe we knew better and just didn't take action contributes to the rise of cynicism and dangerous breakdown of confidence in our institutions. When the place you call home is burned down, blown away, or flooded, when you lose your possessions, maybe your pets, your livelihood, see injuries, illness, and death, the mix of fear, anger, sorrow, and trauma can easily send us to the breaking point. Mental health professionals are seeing a full range of psychiatric disorders emerge in these situations. Major depression, anxiety, PTSD, a rise in drug and alcohol abuse as people attempt to cope. Family stress leads to domestic violence, mostly against women. It includes child abuse. And some of us are lucky enough to be at a distance from the world's ongoing extreme weather events, but we're not potted plants sitting here. What scars are forming in us seeing others drowned, burned, flooded, or starved? Chronic climate conditions, drought from persistent high temperatures are driving up suicides among farmers in India, rural Australia, South Africa, and leading to rationing and water wars here in the US. With persistent high temperatures and the ever-expanding desert it creates, the Middle East, it is predicted, may well be uninhabitable by the end of the century. Sea level rise. Tens of millions of Americans live on the coastline. Without a sharp in reduction in greenhouse gases, Jim Hansen says, global sea level is likely to increase 10 to 13 feet in as few as 50 years. Parts of our coastal cities would still be sticking above the water, but you couldn't live there. Small island nations will be swallowed up. Air pollution is primarily the result of burning fossil fuels. Higher temperatures speed up the chemical reactions that form it. In addition to the links to asthma, cancers, lung, ovarian, liver, respiratory illnesses, heart disease, changes to DNA that narrow coronary arteries and trigger heart attacks, atrial fibrillation, lifelong decreased lung volume in children, obesity, diabetes, spiking rates of autism and autoimmune disorders, polluted air is also a cause of inflammation of brain tissue. Ultrafine particulate matter, that's less than one micron, cross directly into the brain from the nose when we breathe, causing inflammatory processes that are linked to dementia, Parkinson's, and ALS. Multiple lines of evidence support the role of neuroinflammation in classic psychiatric illnesses, major depressive disorders, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, obsessive compulsive disorders. How much ultrafine particulate matter is in the air? Regulations to measure do not exist. Yet ultrafine particulate matter makes up the bulk of the particles in the air and is taken to be much more hazardous to our health. Emergency room visits for anxiety and suicide threats are significantly higher on days with poor air quality. The American Psychological Association, are we losing, are we losing, oops, ma'am? No, 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 no slides? No. Oh, okay, good, okay. The American Psychological Association reported children exposed to small particles of chemicals in the air were more likely to have symptoms of anxiety or aggression. We know that even low levels of pollution in Sweden, primarily from traffic, are associated with an increased risk of mental illness in children. The researcher who led the study said, I would be worried myself if I lived in an area with high air pollution. 
higher concentrations of CO2 alone impair cognition. Exposing workers to increasing levels of CO2 has significant impact on their cognitive functioning. The testing at indoor concentrations to which Americans are frequently exposed already show the serious decline in our ability to think strategically, to use information, and to respond to a crisis. Not everything that counts can be counted. It is the inchoate, insidious, complex, and unconscious psychological states driven by climate trauma, not lending themselves to studies and precise numbers, that are the most profoundly damaging and drive systemic emotional conditions society will find difficult to treat and surmount. When it comes to the reach of emotional pain, as poet John Donne said, no man is an island. The waves of injury from climate trauma and frustration from inaction are already reverberating across families, the workplace, our communities, cumulatively taking a toll on the national mood. Repercussions from a stressed out national mood affect our economy, our politics, our relations with other countries. It shapes our culture and increasingly affects how we treat each other. Nations are like families. After 25 years in practice, I can aver that children who grow up feeling they were neglected can be deeply damaged. The belief that they have been cheated and mistreated can last a lifetime and leave them feeling resentful and the sense of abandonment interfering with their sense, own sense of commitment, fostering a defeatist attitude, making them unwilling to take initiative themselves. Future generations will know that they were neglected. If proper action on climate is not taken, it begs the question, will they be different? I can see this one coming on the other side of the spectrum, a climate crisis victimization syndrome, where instead of making every effort to rise above the psychological pain of the climate crisis, everything is instead blamed on it, stifling personal growth. Intentional versus accidental harm. When disasters are no longer experienced solely as acts of God or nature, but derived from the behavior of humans, it is much tougher on us because what happens from intentional negligence is harder to put behind us than what happens accidentally. The rise of an anxious world. We can be anxious and not know why. We can be anxious and not know it. Sometimes anxiety is manifested as anger or another emotion or state that doesn't even suggest the root cause. We can be anxious and give it the wrong name, often if the real source is especially unsettling. We don't always recognize the psychological toll that anxiety is having on us. Climate change evokes a profound sense of anxiety from feelings of powerlessness. People typically try to repress, that is make unconscious, what makes us feel powerless. Most of us can accept knowing that we are worried about climate and don't repress it entirely because we can accept that it is natural to feel vulnerable. Instead of accepting the fear, though, that comes from feeling vulnerable, deniers tend to experience the fear as emasculating for a variety of reasons. These men, especially, are trying to offset the fear that deep down inside only reminds them or sometimes reminds them that being fearful is like being a girly man. Their outward display, denial, is simply overcompensation. A therapeutic approach, generally, to help deniers, happy to offer myself, would be to address the personal insecurities that stand in the way of accepting reality. More obviously can be said about this. Much of the violence in the world can be explained by unaddressed anxiety emanating from the feeling of powerlessness. Whether we know it or not, whether we accept it or not, there isn't the slightest shred of a doubt in my mind that we are already full of anxiety about climate change and that it is driving us towards an increasingly stressed out world. Will we be in a growing state of fear from diminished productivity, distrust of each other, conflict between haves and have-nots, callousness, numbness in our response to suffering, compassion fatigue, and alienated citizenry? Will we have the opportunity to innovate or work our way out of this? Ecosystems disrupted. You can't have healthy individuals on a sick planet. Biodiversity lost both animals and plants. In the last 50 years, wildlife, it has been estimated, has declined by 40 percent. 
Professionals specializing in the effects of climate on animals or habitat are themselves no stranger to trauma. Experts cite the loss of career-long passions, the coral reef that has been destroyed by bleaching, the frog species believed to be extinct. In our fight for the climate, it has been said that we should think of people, not polar bears, a legitimate reminder that privileged groups overlook the environmental injustices affecting people in places where socioeconomic challenges impede the ability to be heard. But animals are central to our existence. We know that our special bond with pets has enormous psychological benefits, lowering anxiety, sensitivity to pain, aggression, improving learning, empathy, social confidence, and that this bond lowers blood pressure and heart rate and boosts the immune system. One biological messenger is likely oxytocin, the human bonding hormone associated with fostering trust and altruism. Studies show the green space in which wild animals live provides the same physical and psychological benefits that having pets does. After spending time in nature, we are more generous. Shinrin-yoku forest bathing is a movement in Japan dedicated to providing city dwellers with the healing effects of green space. We are risking profound psychosocial damage as we stray from the ecosystems we were evolved to share with other species. It may be 30%, but up to 50% of species are headed towards extinction, you heard it right, by mid-century. Some of humanity's most troubling problems could be treatable by studying our animal relatives. Below are examples of animals that carry a treasure trove of potentially life-saving information and are at risk specifically or are from a class at risk. From the work of Nobel laureate Eric Shivian with Dr. Ari Bernstein, the African clawed frog produces antimicrobials that make them immune to common human infections. They could be the key that unlocks a whole new class of antibiotics, not bad in an era where bacteria are increasingly becoming resistant. Dog sharks secrete squalamines that can cut off the blood supply to ovarian and lung cancers and maybe other cancers. Cone snails secrete substances that have a thousand times the pain-killing capacity of morphine and are already being used in the spinal fluid of people with intractable pain. They are threatened by coral reef die-offs. Salamanders cut off a limb and they grow a new one. We know this capacity is hidden somewhere in our DNA, but where? Polar bears hibernate and lose calcium. Think treating osteoporosis. When they are back on their feet, calcium goes right back on their bones. How does that work? It doesn't happen in captivity. It has become a race against time to get the data before some of these species are lost our food supply at risk. Climate change leads to food insecurity by reducing the amount and quality of the food we can produce. Every one degree centigrade rise in temperature results in a decrease of 10% in food and agricultural output. The price of food goes up, and in parts of the world where as much as 80% of income goes on food, shortages and higher prices upend communities with fighting, rationing, and the stress of hunger. High levels of CO2 lower nutrients such as iron, zinc, and protein in exactly the crops the world's poor mostly depend on. Food insecurity destabilizes governments, damages our health, and harms our communities. The masses of refugees in the throes of the worst drought in 900 years were on the road in Syria looking for food in places that didn't want them and wouldn't help them, tripping the geopolitical wire that brought us the catastrophe we see today. Oceans. High levels of CO2 dissolve into our oceans, causing acidification, impeding the growth of key species of the food web, including the ocean's nursery, coral reefs. More than a billion people rely on food from the oceans as their primary source of protein. Bacteria from algal blooms associated with climate change produce a neurotoxin, BMAA, beta-methylamino-L-alanine, that enters our food chain. The brain tissue of humans exposed to this neurotoxin shows some of the same changes that are seen in Alzheimer's, ALS, and Parkinson's. BMAA is found in commercially marketed seafood. Threats to world order. Though the result of multiple forces, climate change today is a root cause of the explosion of refugees looking for safety. Destabilized regions, as resources become scarcer, the competition for them become fiercer. Fragile nations fail. 
In Europe, a sharp turn to the right politically, and I used to say, we shall see here in America. Now we have our answer. In the U.S., with 5% of the world's population, we put up 25% of the world's greenhouse gases. Jihadists are already using global warming as a rallying cry against us. We may be in denial, but they are not. Papers swept up during the storm of Osama bin Laden's compound in Abbottabad and early letters show his focus on America's role in causing climate change. And I quote, you have destroyed nature with your industrial waste and gases more than any other nation in history. These are tough words to hear from a fiend with so much blood on his hands, but how do we answer this? Will we become pariahs? As a former CIA profiler, I fear for our democratic way of life. The rise of authoritarian government is always a possibility. In times of peril and scarcity, people turn to what they perceive as strong leaders to protect them. They are willing to give up their freedoms in exchange for perceived security. Heaven help us from the tyrants this can unleash. The experiences of citizens stranded at the Superdome in New Orleans in the days after Contrita are an example of how quickly our systems can be overwhelmed and our faith in them turned upside down. Faith in a functional government is the sine qua non of a stable society. Special populations at risk are children, the elderly, the sick, the disabled, the mentally ill, those living in the bullseye of disaster-prone areas, along coastlines and rivers, tornado alleys, inner cities with the heat island effect, first responders, climate Cassandras who suffer from pre-traumatic stress disorder in the grip of images of future disasters they can't put out of their minds. In the first published climate change delusion, a 17-year-old Australian boy had to be hospitalized for refusing to drink water, believing it would cause millions in his drought-ridden country to die of thirst. The Melbourne Children's Hospital who treated him told me he has a clinic full of children with climate anxieties. Transgenerational epigenetic inheritance carried by an on-off switch, the activation of a human gene for stress in the face of trauma can be passed on to succeeding generations compounding the, the toll. And now some taboo issues, aggression. When we put people in harm's way, there's a name for it. It's called aggression. Inaction on climate is a display of aggression towards future generations. What we eat. Transitioning to a low carbon plant-based diet is the only way to save the world from hunger, fuel shortages, and climate change, says the United Nations Environmental Program, which has declared essential a global shift towards a plant-based diet. Traveling by air. Acknowledging the tremendous carbon co costs of airline travel, climate communication stylist George Marshall points out we would have to save nearly 800,000 plastic bags to offset a one-way trip from Australia to the UK. Environmental grief. A new term has been coined, solastalgia, to describe the pain of seeing lands that once created the treasured sense of home now lost or irreparably damaged. Should I have a baby? is a question increasingly being asked by young people worried about the carbon costs of bringing another person into the world. A doctoral student in anthropology at Stanford and one of his friends whom I am in contact with have been discussing rational suicide in the face of climate and carbon impacts. And the ultimate psychosocial impact is we register these warnings and ponder the overwhelming beauty and complexity of nature, inspiring us with awe and wonder what finally is the cost of all of this to our souls? In my years as a psychiatrist, I have seen children suffer physically and emotionally at the hands of adults. As we look over recent events in our nation, when we consider how much physical and emotional suffering will come to our children, how can inaction on climate be interpreted as anything other than child abuse? And lastly, one way, thank you. Lastly, entitlement. Though well-off members of society sometimes rail at financial entitlements given to those on the lower end of the socioeconomic totem pole, the entitlement that is the most unjust is the one rarely mentioned, leading a high carbon lifestyle. 10% of the world's richest emit 50% of the world's greenhouse gases. And lastly, Norwegian sociologist Stein Ringen warned in 2014 that the UK and the US were in trouble 
because of multiple stressors. The gap between the haves and the have-nots, corruption here in the U.S., money for political contributions in exchange for policy votes, and complacency. When the lights went out in Athens, ring and warn, it was 2,000 years again before constitutional democracy emerged. Democracy is not a default form of government. Social, injustice is social justice is never guaranteed. As climate trauma exacerbates these conditions, we must steel ourselves with resolve and resilience because in this critical moment in the history of civilization, we are the ones who are here. Thank you very much. So thank you very much. And since both of you mentioned it, thank you for a prime example of adaptation. <laughs>